All right, so let's take a little, uh, little bit of time to just kind of dive in and think about how we would approach playing rhythm on the instrument, okay? Strumming versus chopping, trying to find perhaps a combination of the two. Um, as we've looked at, you know, how we go about playing our two finger chords, no problem, right? But if we start thinking about trying to play, play those bluegrass chop chords, I mean, I don't know about you, but that's just, that's impossible for me to do on this instrument. My, my fingers just don't have that kind of stretch to them. So let's look at trying to combine the two things. Um, now there are times where if I'm playing the octave mandolin, I'd, I'd sort of just treat it like a different instrument. Um, I play guitar as well, and I'm sure some of you do. Um, so you're already used to knowing how to play a strumming consistent pattern, and in fact, um, even if you've moved on through the more advanced section of the mandolin course and you're just now checking out this, this portion with the octave, you've already done a combination of, you know, chop chords and strumming. Um, one of the first things we, we practice doing with the um, two finger chord is to alter, alternate between bass lines. So G strum, D strum, G strum, D strum. Okay, just like a guitar player would. And on the octave mandolin, it's a really rich sound because we have such a low, uh, low sound here with that low G and it just rings through nice and beautifully. So now, especially um, if you're a vocalist and you're trying to to sing and play, the octave mandolin can be great accompaniment. That's one of the reasons I started playing a lot of octave mandolin is just to have a different sound to sing with. Um, I loved the idea of kind of being able to, there's a lot of kind of solo singer, songwriter, guitarist, um, and it, it's a very similar approach when you sing and play octave mandolin, but you get all the mandolin voicings with this instrument. Okay, so this is something you're familiar with by now, I'm sure. Alternating between those, those bass lines. Do the same thing moving up to the four chord. Let's go ahead and practice that stack chord. Learned that in the intermediate section. All right, back to our two finger chord here. Okay, piece of cake, right? So now what if we wanted to go, all right, let's figure out how we can chop on this instrument or at least play a little bit more percussively, um, but still use these open voices. Um, because of course, if we're trying to do our regular chop, we typically lean on that four finger um, chop shape. Now we did cover this in the mandolin course as well that you can chop using open chords by deadening the strings with your ring finger and your pinky. The same thing we can do on the octave mandolin. So if we play, we strum through a two finger chord and we have these two open strings, we simply just stop the vibration, same as we do on a four finger chop chord where we release the tension and um, stop the vibration that way. Well, with the open strings though, we're actually laying our ring finger and our pinky down flat. Stopping the vibration, right? Okay, now the octave can be a little bit clunky sound and because it's so low, if all we did is Now there's times that that can be cool, right? Just like everything, there's always exceptions, um, musical situations, we really have to use our ear to decide how we want to play rhythm on this instrument. But I think a good uh, practice technique is to also try to combine the two, so. I'm letting it um, ring out just a little bit, still kind of using that, that basic alternating bass line approach and allowing some upstrokes in there to happen. And then 
dampening the strings in between, right? So it's not but a little bit of a combo. Now sometimes with the octave mandolin, because it's so big, I will use my palm to sort of dampen the strings every once in a while. So as I'm laying these fingers down, I'm also sometimes getting some percussion and dampening from back here. Which I would never really do on the uh, regular mandolin very much, but again, this is a larger instrument, so our approach can change just a little bit to kind of find our end goals, be able to meet our goals. about this this two finger open G shape okay now you could play out of your first inversions and, and second inversions but that that open low string is kind of hard to beat I think on the octave it, it's just so powerful sounding so I, I really try to lean into that as much as possible okay let's say we're playing in G and we have um, a song that's going to A and so we need to be able to move to our A chord. Now I showed you how to make this, this power chord using one finger on the mandolin, which is the common way to play that, focusing on the bottom G and the top D, right? If I try to do that on this instrument, it's definitely much too big. I'm gonna have a sort of a split string thing happening, which sounds pretty cool, but we don't want that if we're trying to go to A. Okay, so you could try to, to bar this if that's easier for you, but again, I find that to be a little bit more challenging and harder to apply um, to situations where I'm coming in and out of playing lines. So I want to feel like I can solo at some point, you know, the end goal, depending on what you're trying to get out of the octave mandolin. Maybe you're just trying to play rhythm, and if so, then you can play, you can play your bar chords. Now the bar chords are a little easier to get to because again, hopefully you've sort of trained your fingers to be able to, to make them using the pinky and the ring finger. Uh, again, if, if you've been practicing them this way, that's going to be really tough to get to. So again, just like with the regular mandolin, I would um, strongly suggest that you try to practice these fingerings with the pinky and the ring finger. A little stretchy on that as well, but we can still apply that same technique, okay? But let's say we want, to pl we want to play the A power chord like this. But we're like, oh, we can't do it. And doing it this way is hard to get clean. I simply just stack. Now, honestly, you can use your first finger. You can use your middle finger. A lot of times you'll see me play it like this. Now, why is that? Because I love to have the ability to roll from the first fret to the second fret. Um, if you ever watch a guitar player play a basic G chord, especially in bluegrass, a lot of times they won't even be playing the B note on the A string under their first finger. You'll see them playing it more open with this, with this first finger off the string. And a big reason for that is, is because they, they typically will, will roll from that F sharp note into the, the low G note. You know, they use that finger as an accent and kind of be ready to play a, a bluegrass G run. So octave mandolin can kind of be that way too. We have a little bit more, a little bit more space to uh, stack our fingers on this instrument. So again, just moving from G. Now, it doesn't mean I'd always do it that way. Of course, it kind of depends on the context of what I'm playing, but I think you can kind of experiment. This is a, a very unusual instrument, so we have to kind of uh, move our way around and 
see what works based on what we're playing.